the world is changing. Technological advancements bring us to new frontiers where we don't always know what's in store for us over the horizon. An excess of data, contained within our pockets and accessed within seconds, has led to information overload, with the lines between fact and fiction becoming ever harder to ascertain. And societal divides, both old and new, play out in repeating circles, getting more and more entrenched and leaving a society that's fractured. This is the world we live in, and in the brave new world of tomorrow, what is the answer to uncertainty, misinformation and division? Who can you trust? How do you find answers? And what can you believe in? This is what Deus Ex is about. The series is a paranoid look at our future, which examines society and humanity's changing role within it, with, at times, more insight than you may be comfortable with. It paints its picture of dystopia in dark, cynical brushstrokes that can sometimes be a little wild, but yet still often manage to stay relatable. In fact, in certain aspects, the first game has bordered on being prophetic, and most of the themes of this series have only increased in relevance as time's gone by. But Deus Ex is also noteworthy for its commitment to open-ended, player-driven gameplay. Blending first-person role-playing with immersive sim design, the series has championed player choices that have tangible, mechanical impacts on the player's experience, with level design that rewards exploration, and systems that allow for varied and emergent solutions to the many problems you encounter. In these aspects, the first Deus Ex in particular remains an industry gold standard, and all of its successors have attempted to stay true to this core design philosophy, with varying levels of success. The series also shows a shifting of focus that reflects broader industry changes, and more than a few examples of questionable management of a franchise that may have deserved better. The future of Deus Ex is currently unknown, but its past at least provides plenty to talk about. This video will look at every Deus Ex game released to date, while focusing on the different ways they've tackled the themes of the series and the evolution of their core gameplay. These are topics I have a lot to say about, and some of this might not be what you expect. So join me on this globe-trotting, decade-spanning adventure as we step into this world of secret societies, technological troubles, and conspiracy theories. Be warned, this video will have spoilers for each of the games discussed, and man, is there a lot to discuss. First though, a quick word about this video's sponsor, Surfshark. The Illuminati may or may not be controlling the global economy in order to facilitate an augmented revolution to create an AI singularity to allow some guy named Bob to rule the world as a new human AI god, and that's not what you want. The future is scary, and who knows what's in store for us, but one thing you can do at least is protect yourself online with a VPN like Surfshark. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that allows you to safeguard your identity online by protecting you from data theft, tracking, surveillance, and more. It also allows you to access online content as if you were in a different country anytime you wish with just the click of a button, which means you can watch Netflix content only available in other countries, as well as bypass blocked websites or other types of geo-restrictions and censorship on the internet. Surfshark are one of the leading VPN providers, and you can use my code, never knows best, to get an 83% discount plus 3 extra months for free. There's a 30 day money back guarantee if you change your mind, so check the link in the description if you're interested, and otherwise, let's get on with the video. When Deus Ex released in 2000, there weren't any other games like it. 20 years later, that's still mostly true. There's a great quote which sums this game up from the game director and industry titan, Warren Spector, about his thoughts before release. If people get that, that you can fight, sneak, or talk, we're gonna rule the world. If people compare our combat to Half-Life, we're dead. If people compare our sneaking to Thief, we're dead. And if people compare our role-playing elements to Baldur's Gate, we're dead. 
It was the way Deus Ex combined elements from different genres that made it stand out so much, but while it may have taken aspects from a diverse range of genres, at its heart there was always a clear and consistent driving force of creating player freedom. For inspiration, Spectre cites the first time he played a Dungeons & Dragons campaign, as well as his experience playing Thief for Dark Project, where he got stuck during one particular stealth section, which made him want to create a similar experience where stealth was just one option of many and where if the player got stuck trying one approach, they could just change to another. This is reflected clearly in the finished game. Deus Ex features big open levels, but there are always multiple routes through them, with different skills and items that can be taken advantage of, and non-conventional options many players won't even be aware of. Before you actually get to that though, you'll need to go through character creation. You can't change much about your name or appearance here, which gives an early indication that Deus Ex might not be as focused on being an RPG as other games in the genre. This is okay because its strength comes from how it combines its various aspects, and if that means it's light on some elements players might expect in a role-playing game, it still more than makes up for this in other ways. This does mean, however, that you'll always play as J.C. Denton, who is a man with opinions. How does it feel to be ordered to murder civilians just because they support the fastest growing political movement in this nation's history? In a democracy, armed rebellion is criminal, not political. In conversations, the player has little input, and Denton may express himself in ways you wouldn't, displaying an outlook on the world you may not agree with. This allows conversations to be more direct, and serve a specific purpose in the narrative, but that's not the reason why I'm mentioning this. It's because, over time, many people have come to think of an RPG as being about player choice, and the first things that come to most people's minds when they think about player choice is usually character creation, dialogue choices, and being able to define parts of the player character's personality. And that's fair enough, there's certainly nothing wrong with these things, but Deus Ex has basic character creation, few meaningful dialogue choices, and no freedom to define Denton's personality. And yet, it's still a game focused entirely on player choice. It's because of this that Deus Ex acts as a great example to show how player choice can be about more than what people usually think of, and this is a large part of the reason for why this game is so important. Traditional role-playing games have always had a large focus placed on player expression, with the main thing that makes them stand out being the amount of freedom that a format constrained only by player imagination can provide. Role-playing video games, however, have often struggled to replicate this, even if they've been successful in other ways, and really, the games that may have come closest aren't RPGs at all, but rather, immersive sims. If you don't know what immersive sims are, they're a genre of video games even more poorly defined than RPGs, and this video doesn't really seem the place to try and rectify that. As far as I can tell, however, what really makes a game an immersive sim is being able to pick up unimportant objects and turn on bathroom taps for no reason. There may be other qualities games of this genre share, but these two seem to be the most important. I must admit, part of me has always wondered why picking up random crap and wasting water are so significant to the genre, but I guess the obvious answer is likely correct. Interacting with the environment is more immersive. And snide as I may be, I have to admit that I do often find myself interacting with objects for no actual reason quite frequently. Hell, it was the first thing I did on this playthrough, and the moment where Paul ran up to me, and there I was just playing with this bag of trash I'd just found, made me feel surprisingly guilty. Paul, I thought you were in Hong Kong. Interacting with objects does tend to serve a purpose in immersive sim games, however, and Deus Ex is no exception. They can be used to create sound to get a guard's attention, or stacked on top of each other to create platforms to climb on, or just moved to the side to uncover hidden routes. A big part of immersive sims is emergent gameplay. This is when you're given a range of tools and then left to find solutions to problems on your own. Movable objects are one such tool in Deus Ex. Others include the player's augmentations, which are like upgrades for the player's body that have a range of beneficial effects as well as the player's skills, which can allow you to open locks, bypass security systems, and hack into computers. Then there are items in your inventory, 
which, in addition to a large variety of weapons, can contain items that allow you to survive toxic environments, or go invisible, or breathe underwater. Then there is the most obvious tool, good old fashioned violence, which can be useful on both NPCs and any objects you may take a particular dislike to. And for the more refined amongst us, there's also stealth and non-lethal methods of incapacitation. The end result is every problem does have multiple solutions, and while this still might not quite match the absolute freedom of traditional role-playing experiences, it's still a lot closer to this than most games. To illustrate all this, let's look at one of the very first problems the player might run into. Finding your way into the enemy base on the first mission. In your way stands a formidable opponent, an unyielding shaped mass of reinforced steel. It, it's, a, a, it's a door, there's a locked door in the way. To combat this mighty foe, you can use a couple of lockpicks to open it that way, or hack into a nearby computer terminal if you have your computer skill high enough, or find a datapad that has a password for the terminal if you lack that skill, or meet with an NPC informant in another part of the map to get the key directly that way. You can also go in guns blazing, and weaken an enemy NPC near the door, and then wait for them to get scared and retreat, hopefully opening the door for you on their way. Or you can go for the locked door, non-lethal approach, leaving the poor innocent inanimate object exactly how it is, and instead find a stack of crates in another part of the map to climb up instead. And hell, maybe there's other ways inside as well that I'm not even aware of. I don't know, I'm not creative. The point is, you have options. You just have to get out there and find them. It's this commitment to giving the player options that makes Deus Ex work so well, but this wouldn't mean very much without being supported by good level design. Unlike a certain American president, Deus Ex tends to favour a rather hands-off approach. It's usually happy to just tell players what their objective is, and then leave it up to them to work out how to achieve this. It's worth repeating that Deus Ex's levels are big and open, but you have no quest markers or mini-map to guide you. In some areas, you're given a map of some kind, or some satellite images, to help you orient yourself. These maps aren't perfect representations of the in-game environment however, like you may see in modern games. Instead, they're images of an actual map, which means the player's position isn't marked, and they often only provide limited information. This in itself is pretty cool. It's a lot more immersive to have to look at an actual map and try to work out where you are and where to go, than to just have a magic GPS system to track your every move and signpost your destination. What makes this really work, however, is that because you don't know exactly where to go, or how best to get there, the game forces you to explore. Other games, including some within this same series, will reward exploration in various ways. This might be through giving you experience points, or having collectible items, and so on. Deus Ex also gives you bonus skill points, and has very useful items for you to find, but the thing I really want to stress here is that exploration is necessary. It's not just something optional that you're rewarded for doing, it's how you play the game. Exploration is the only way to find where to go, and what to do. Having so little guidance might sound frustrating, particularly for players more used to modern games, but the great thing about how Deus Ex is designed is that because there are always multiple routes through levels, and a variety of solutions to problems, getting stuck becomes increasingly unlikely. If you don't know what to do or where to go, you just need to keep exploring, and then when you do find something that works through this exploration, it's a lot more rewarding than simply following a quest marker or mini-map. Deus Ex also isn't overly generous with the items it gives you, which forces you to make choices that actually matter. You can customise your character through skills, which are increased through skill points you acquire from completing objectives, as well as through augmentations, which are found as augmentation canisters in-game and can be upgraded through another findable item. Augmentations are cybernetic upgrades which enhance JC Denton's physical characteristics, or allow you to use new abilities like invisibility or health regeneration. There's a grand total of 20 augmentations, however each augmentation canister contains two different augments, of which you can only equip one, forcing you to make decisions based on which upgrade sounds more useful to you. 
For skills, there are 11 options, some of which are more focused on your combat ability, whereas others assist you in non-combat ways. 11 isn't an especially large number, and some of these are also less valuable than others, like poor swimming, which everyone likes to pick on for being bad, and rightfully so, as you can get an in-game item called a rebreather that makes investing points into swimming fairly redundant. Augmentations can also feel a little hit or miss, which is to be expected, although I do think the game would have benefited a lot from making certain augments function as passive abilities. As it is, every augment has to be toggled on and off, and will consume energy when active. The amount is often low, but for several augments this just feels unnecessary. Like for the Power Recirculator augment, which reduces the energy cost of all other augments. Even this needs to be activated, which means you have to spend energy to toggle on an augment that reduces energy of other augments. So, every time you want to use an augment, you need to toggle on the Energy Saver augment first, which just feels like extra unneeded button pressing, and leaves you forever paranoid about whether you left your Energy Saver augment on by mistake. As for the non-combat skills, each one of them is made to feel very useful because of the game's approach to level design, but the player also isn't punished for not investing in these skills because of the specific way they work. To open a lock or bypass an electronic device, you need a lockpick or a multi-tool respectively, and the difficulty of the lock or device will determine how many lockpicks or multi-tools it requires. By increasing your lockpicking or electronic skill, you increase your effectiveness with these items, and so will need to use less of them to open stuff. This means even if you don't invest in these skills, you are still not locked out of accessing the things they open, you'll just need to spend more items to do so. This creates a degree of resource management, where you'll have to decide what things may be worth accessing, but it also ensures that lockpicks and multi-tools remain valuable for the game's duration, as the more you have, the more stuff you'll be able to access, and potentially, the more skill points you'll free up to be able to invest into other things. Overall, this approach works great, although the same can't be said for hacking, which by contrast requires no consumable item to use, and one skill point in computers is also enough to hack every computer in the game. This provides far too much reward for too little investment, while also making the passwords and logging details that can be found by searching the environment feel rather redundant, and the game would be improved if hacking was closer to the other two mentioned skills. Still, for the most part, the way Deus Ex uses its augments and skills to create choices and offer new paths through its levels is very good. The result is a game where player freedom and exploration are baked into the core design, as opposed to being tacked on as afterthoughts, and this leads to a gameplay experience that is both rewarding and very replayable. There aren't many games that can match Deus Ex in this regard, but this is only half of the reason people view this game so fondly. The rest has to do with the narrative, so let's talk story. The year is… not actually known. Later games would clarify that this is 2052, but Deus Ex itself never tells you, and I think that's the right choice. As soon as you know the exact year a futuristic setting is meant to be, you nearly always start to pick away at its details in your mind. You question the likelihood that this specific thing is possible in this specific time frame, and the more time that passes, and the clearer the differences between fiction and reality become, the worse this problem can be. I mean, for an example, look no further than Deus Ex Human Revolution, which takes place in 2027. This is now only 7 years away instead of 18, and it seems pretty obvious that this isn't what the future will look like. After all, there isn't much time left to develop advanced augments, or a universal gold filter over everything. But the first game doesn't have this problem, and it comes across as much more timeless and grounded as a result. So, for now at least, pretend that the year isn't known, and doesn't matter. All that's relevant is that this is the future. And it sucks. The opening cutscene will inform you that people are rioting as a new plague is spreading amongst the population. In the current year, this sounds eerily familiar, but don't worry, the men in charge have a solution. This plague, the rioting is intensifying to the point where we may not be able to contain it. Why contain it? 
Let it spill over to the schools and churches. Let the bodies pile up in the streets. In the end, they'll beg us to save them. Huh. I think I prefer the whole stay home, save lives, and wear a mask message of my own government. And I guess that's how you know things are really bad in this future, because it starts to make the present day and present day governments look good by comparison. Still, I'm sure the player will save the day. Enter JC Denton, a newly trained UNATCO agent enhanced with cutting edge nanotechnology that allows his body to far surpass normal human capabilities. UNATCO stands for the United Nations Anti-Terrorist Coalition. In this future, the power and influence of the UN has continued to grow, but so has unrest. The first mission in game tasks you with infiltrating a decaying Statue of Liberty to intercept a terrorist group who have set up base within. The symbolism here is pretty obvious, but I think it's effective all the same. Anyway, you find out the Statue of Liberty was actually destroyed in a separate terrorist attack a year earlier, and from this you might be wondering just how common terrorist attacks are in this futuristic land of the free. The answer seems to be that they're pretty common, and if you talk to people in the bars and on the streets, you'll soon see why. The public aren't very happy, and there are good reasons for that. Things were bad before the plague, but now they're even worse, and there's some pretty strange ideas going around about who's to blame. Your first real exposure to this is the terrorist leader in the Statue of Liberty. Don't believe me? It's all in the numbers. For a hundred years, there's been a conspiracy of plutocrats against ordinary people. You have a single fact to back that up. Number one. To save some time, yes, he has plenty. Falling corporation tax and self-employment rates, corporate and government consolidation, Rockefellers and Rothschilds. He almost starts to sound like he's talking a lot of sense, until you remember, he's a terrorist. You might also hear people claim that the plague spreading across the world, known as the Grey Death, is man-made, and that the government and UNATCO are using their power to ensure only the elite will receive a vaccine. It's a worrying idea, but conspiracy theories often are. Still, nothing you need to worry about. For now. As well as the setting, the first mission will also introduce you to Deus Ex's gameplay. If you're expecting a traditional first person shooter, you might be disappointed, because even if you can shoot in first person, someone forgot to tell the aiming reticule what's going on, and so you'll have to wait. Quite a long time for it to shrink enough for your bullets to reliably go where you want them to. This can be improved by increasing your weapon skills, but Deus Ex will never be very satisfying if you view it purely as an FPS. Your lack of effectiveness in combat does give you a pretty good incentive to try out stealth however, while also forcing you to think about your approach to each combat encounter. Anyway, your ability with firearms might be limited by your low skill level, but there are always weapons that require less finesse. And if you really want to go in guns blazing, it's still an option. However, for those who haven't forgotten to take the ADHD medication this morning, you'll probably want to at least make selective use of stealth. There are no necessary skills for stealth, so it's an option that will always be available to you, although it can be made more effective with augments. Stealth does have a few problems in Deus Ex, which are largely due to the player not being sure whether enemies can see them or not. Most stealth games would have some kind of indicator to provide the player with this information, but in Deus Ex you're left to guess and it mostly comes down to how far away you are. In the first level you can walk under street lamps, and as long as enemies aren't too close they won't have any awareness you're there. Stealth gets harder once you head into more enclosed spaces, and if you really want to make your way through the game undetected, you'll probably have to develop an intimate familiarity with your quick save key. Brute forcing your way through the game on the back of quick saving and quick loading isn't very satisfying and can remove a lot of the tension that a stealth game should have, although being allowed to quick save at any time does at least have the advantage of allowing player experimentation. Despite these problems, I do enjoy the stealth in Deus Ex, but it's hard to deny that this game's core gameplay can, overall, be a little janky. The AI doesn't always seem to display a high degree of intelligence either, and I suppose while we're admitting more obvious flaws, it also has to be said that Deus Ex's presentation hasn't aged that gracefully. Even in the year 2000, it wasn't the best looking game on the market, 
and 20 years later, its early 3D graphics haven't got any better. The environments might be big, but they're also lacking in detail, overly boxy, and often rather empty. Animations also tend to be quite awkward, and up close, NPC models look downright awful. Which is a shame, because the presentation during dialogue is actually surprisingly well done, with good use of varied camera angles and smooth transitions in and out of conversations. Voice acting also isn't that bad, as long as you accept that the level of quality may not be very consistent, and you don't mind Denton's iconic deadpan delivery. Still, even if its presentation and gunplay can make Deus Ex hard to get into, if you stick with it, you'll soon see the game's strong points. For now though, let's get back to the story. With the terrorist threat dealt with on Liberty Island, JC returns to the UNATCO headquarters, which is conveniently located right next door. But this aside, it's an interesting location that you'll be in and out of a few times. Here you can speak to some of your co-workers to find out a bit more information about the setting. There's a decent amount of reactivity through this, with both your boss and the UNATCO Quartermaster regularly commenting on the way the player has or has not completed objectives, and they even give extra rewards if they agree with your actions. Once you're done with seeing the sights and being told off for entering the woman's bathroom, you'll be sent back out to deal with the same terrorist group, who have stolen a shipment of grey death vaccine that you're now tasked with recovering. This will take you to the game's first hub area, Hell's Kitchen, New York, and here the game opens up a bit more with the addition of some side quests and a larger area to explore. As you continue to track down the vaccine shipment, you'll cross paths several times with your brother Paul, who likewise is a cybernetically enhanced UNACO agent. However, just before you finally intercept the vaccine shipment, along with one of the terrorist group's main financers, a man named Lebedev, Paul confronts you and reveals that he's a double agent and is now working for the terrorists. He tells you that the terrorists are actually in the right, and that it's the government and UNATCO preventing the populace from receiving that vaccine. After this bombshell, Paul takes off, leaving you to wonder who's telling the truth and whether you're doing the right thing. But you still have a mission to complete. You continue onwards and interrogate Lebedev in hopes to uncover more pieces of the picture, but another UNATCO agent named Anna arrives and instead orders you to kill him. What you do next is up to you, although Deus Ex doesn't prevent this as a big moral choice. There's no branch in dialogue option telling you this choice matters or to think carefully about your actions. In fact, the game doesn't even acknowledge you have a choice, it just lets you act how you want. If you don't follow your orders, Anna will eventually step in and take actions into her own hands, so whether by your hands or Anna's, Lebedev will die either way. Except, he won't. Because you can also choose to attack Anna here. If you do this, Lebedev will survive, and it'll also prevent you from having to fight Anna later in the game, but a lot of people won't even realise this is an option. This is a great moment of choice and consequence, specifically because unlike so many other games, the choice isn't framed in an overly deliberate way, and so its impact is all the more effective. There are several other examples of choices like this in Deus Ex, which can change the fate of your brother and your trusty pilot, and this is the way Deus Ex's story handles player agency, by taking the same hands-off approach as its gameplay, and once more rewarding player experimentation and people who think for themselves. Continuing with the story, JC returns to UNATCO headquarters, where he learns that he and Paul have 24-hour kill switches implanted within them as part of their augmentations. Paul's kill switch is activated as a response to his defection, which leads JC to betray his orders, and so his kill switch gets activated too. During this section, JC gets taken prisoner, and will have to escape the same UNATCO base that was formerly your headquarters. Here you can try to convince some of your former colleagues to come with you, and it's interesting seeing people's different responses and the logic behind their actions. After escaping, you then travel to Hong Kong, as JC looks for a hacker named Tracer Tong, who can help disable the kill switch. In Hong Kong, the story takes a bit of a detour, and the pacing suffers as a result, but the location itself is excellent. Hong Kong is another hub area like Hell's Kitchen, but it's bigger, looks better, and offers much more to explore. 
These moments of non-combat exploration make for a nice change in terms of gameplay, and the busyness of Hong Kong also makes it feel much more lived in than any other location in-game. In Hong Kong, Tracer Tong deactivates JC's kill switch and tasks you with infiltrating VersaLife, who are a multinational biotech corporation whose headquarters are located nearby. The VersaLife headquarters might be my favourite section in the game, because while so many of the places you infiltrate are similar looking military bases, where every inhabitant you encounter shoots you on sight, VersaLife HQ instead lets you start exploring this location as a civilian who's just visiting the facility which gives it a completely different feel and opens up new methods of advancement. At VersaLife, JC discovers that the Grey Death is indeed man-made, and his focus now shifts to stopping the group behind it. This leads you to Paris, where you search for and eventually meet with the Illuminati, who were once a powerful group of men and women who sought to rule the world in secret, but are now a shadow of their former selves after one member, the trillionaire businessman Bob Page, seen previously in the game's opening, betrayed the group to form a new organisation called Majestic 12. Through money and blackmail, Page grew his power, positioning men within important organisations and ultimately creating the Grey Death to further control the world's population. In your quest to stop Page and Majestic 12, you're taken through a number of military bases, with the game ultimately culminating in Area 51. Along the way, JC is helped by a mysterious figure known as Daedalus, who's revealed to be a powerful AI that was originally developed by the Illuminati to aid humanity. In response to this, Page releases his own advanced AI named Icarus, which he developed as a malevolent counterpart to Daedalus. When the AIs come into contact with each other, however, the two merge, forming a new, even more powerful AI named Helios. At Area 51, Page tries to merge himself with Helios to become a human-AI hybrid of immense power that can rule the world, which is revealed to have been Page's real objective all along. JC stops Page, with the story ultimately ending on a choice of who to side with. The Illuminati ask JC to join them as a member, so together they can once more rule the world from the shadows and maintain global order. Tracer Tong asks JC to destroy Helios and disable all global communications, which would plunge the world into a new technological dark age and return civilization to a simpler time. Lastly, Helios asks JC to merge himself with the AI in place of Page, so that together they can create a new consciousness that can rule the world as a benevolent human AI dictator. The choice is ultimately up to you and it's not easy to know who to put your trust in. I like how this game concludes, but the narrative of Deus Ex is often at its best in some of its smaller conversations, where JC speaks to the world's inhabitants about ideology and events. At its core, however, this is still a story about conspiracy theories. The writers of Deus Ex looked at real life for inspiration, and so incorporated a wild range of different real-life conspiracies that were given credence and mixed together to form their very own cyberpunk dystopia of tomorrow. It has to be said that when I said wild, I meant it, and really that's one of the narrative's biggest flaws. As you get further into the game, it can start to feel like Deus Ex is overdosing on conspiracy theories to the point where the setting starts to lose some of its groundedness and believability. There are, after all, little grey aliens in this game, which don't add anything to the story, but might take something away from it. In this way, Deus Ex can feel guilty of not taking itself as seriously as players might want it to, and while this doesn't ruin the narrative, it still seems a bit of a shame, because there's more to this story than crazy conspiracies. You see, even though the conspiracies seen in Deus Ex are a little far-fetched, the fears they're based on aren't, and this is what makes the story good. The first real conversation in the game, with the terrorist leader on Liberty Island, talks about issues like the reduced rate of taxes paid by corporations, and how this leads to corporate consolidation and the disempowerment of the rest of the population, and that's not the crazed machinations of a deluded mind. Reductions in taxes paid by corporations is a sensible talking point 
that can be found in many political conversations taking place today, and arguably is an issue that's even more relevant now than it was in the year 2000. This isn't even a left versus right issue either. Skepticism about globalization and the role of corporations can clearly be seen on both sides of the political divide. It may manifest in different ways, but a lot of the base level concerns are the same. If you take a step back and look at this game in more general terms, you'll see that behind a lot of the conversations in Deus Ex, and a lot of the conspiracy theories that inspired it, lie simple concerns over power. Secret societies, sinister corporations, compromised governments, misleading media, abuse of new technologies, the common thread between these is pretty obvious. It all relates to the disempowerment of the general populace in a changing world, and the fear and anxiety this produces. And this is something that's easy to see outside of Deus Ex as well. The truth is that you, as a normal human being in the 21st century, don't have much power. You are a very small individual who has found yourself in a very big world. Not everything in this world is as it should be, and you can't do much about that. As for the power you do have, guess what? It's shrinking. You are no longer one important individual in a small, tight-knit community, you're a meaningless dot in a sea of billions. The issues that matter cross language barriers and national borders, and are far too big to ever be something you can make a meaningful difference to by yourself. As for your position in this world, it's entirely predicated on governments, mass media, and corporations, but you have no capacity to ever hold such entities accountable. All you really can do is go online and scream into the void, adding more white noise to the incessant buzz that has long since decided it cares little for who makes the most sense, favoring only those who scream the loudest. Globalization and technological advancement are only accelerating these processes, making you smaller and smaller as the world gets bigger, so whatever the future does have in store for us, none of this is going to change. And how could that not worry you? The future means uncertainty, and that's never been something humans have dealt well with. We like to know, we crave answers and so we find them, on conspiracy forums, or in YouTube videos, or in ideologies and politicians that tell us what to think, and it doesn't matter what they say or if they're accurate, as long as they give us something to believe in. And so, with humanity's need for answers, and all this fear and anxiety bubbling away beneath society's surface, it makes sense that someone's going to end up taking advantage of that. That someone probably isn't the Illuminati, and it might be ridiculous to think that it is, but the fear behind such an idea isn't ridiculous at all. There's a clear message behind Deus Ex, and it's not that conspiracy theories are good or true, nor is it that corporations are bad, or governments are bad, or the rich are bad, or science is bad, or anything else like this. It's simply to be sceptical of power. And that's not a bad message to have. You have to remember that scepticism goes both ways. A conspiracy theorist isn't being sceptical if their scepticism is limited to only one direction, and just because Deus Ex features conspiracy theories doesn't mean it endorses them. There's really nothing wrong with fictional portrayals of conspiracies, providing that the work of fiction isn't trying to claim to be anything more than this, and Deus Ex has little grey aliens running around, so it's pretty obvious that this isn't the case. And yet, this game does manage to say something meaningful about our world and the future, and that's something I can respect. Deus Ex uses unproven conspiracies to explore very real concerns, and the result is something that's managed to stay surprisingly relevant to this day, which might be why so many rate this game as highly as they do. Of course, the great game design certainly doesn't hurt things either, and it's not hard to see why this game is considered a classic. It's a shame then that none of its sequels would ever be able to do both of these things quite so well. 
but that didn't stop him from trying. Deus Ex was a clear critical and commercial success, leading developer Iron Storm to soon begin work on a sequel. Series creator Warren Spector would take a step back from his previous role as director, but many members of the original team returned, and in 2003, Deus Ex Invisible War released to positive reviews. Many fans of the original game, however, weren't so generous. Of the four mainline Deus Ex games, Invisible War has a reputation for being the worst. And it's a reputation I think it deserves. A lot of its problems result from the series' move from PC only to Xbox. Invisible War shows a large amount of consolization compared to its predecessor, which makes many aspects of its design and gameplay seem like a downgrade. For the majority of the development team, including game director Harvey Smith, this was their first time designing for console, and subsequent interviews have confirmed that this was something the team struggled with. The story of the first game also didn't leave any obvious direction about where to go next, and the ideas Invisible War does add feel like they lack much of what made the original Deus Ex so memorable. Still, in many ways, Invisible War is a very similar game, and by looking at what's now worse, despite how much stayed the same, you can see which parts of the first game's formula might have mattered more than the developers anticipated. The most obvious of which is the level design. If the original was big and open, Invisible War is instead small and constricted. Large, multi-layered bases have been replaced with a world made entirely of narrow corridors. Even the cities are made of corridors, and this isn't the result of a stylistic choice or some metaphor for a future populace trapped by their maze-like urban existence. No, instead the reason is much more mundane. It's because the game needed to run on the Xbox's more limited hardware. This also meant that there was significant change to the UI. Like how your hotbars are now arranged in a strange circular design that takes up much more screen space than is necessary. The inventory's also been changed from the more than functional grid system of the last game into just 12 slots, which means all items are now considered the same size, so a pack of cigarettes now takes up as much space in your backpack as a sniper rifle. Annoyingly, this makes your already small inventory even smaller, which is made worse by a persistent bug that can stop items from stacking correctly, limiting you even further. Still, if you really want to see bad UI design, just look at how Invisible War displays your objectives, which for some reason are shown individually, forcing you to slowly scroll through each objective one at a time to try to access the specific information you actually need. There's so much wasted space here, when they could have probably fit all this information on screen at once, if they actually tried. Still, despite the price paid by the interface, by 2003 standards, Invisible War was, at least, quite a nice looking game. It had advanced lighting effects, much improved character models, and even some pretty nice ragdoll physics so you can play around with the bodies of those you kill like a bored sociopathic house cat. The downside though is that the environments have been scaled down considerably, and this trade-off just isn't worth it. The result is that Invisible War's levels might look better, but they're not as immersive, and exploration was hit even harder. Even though Invisible War makes many attempts to retain its predecessor's philosophy of multiple approaches and player freedom, the reality is that smaller levels means fewer options to explore and experiment and what divergent pathways you do find feel less meaningful, because regardless of the exact path you take, there's nearly always a sense that they'll just take you to the same destination now. Some areas of the game are better than others in this regard, but overall it's a clear step down. The console-focused level design also means that you'll be running into loading screens with an alarming regularity. This can make moving through the game's small cities surprisingly disjointed and time-consuming, as every few feet you run into more sections of loading. It's also annoying how the game brings up an are you sure box every time you try to change area. This isn't an important decision in my life, and I don't need some extra time to think about it. I clicked the door because I wanted to go through it, and I'd appreciate it if the game could just do us both a favour and take me up my word. As for exploration itself, it's still further diminished by the way the game's mechanics have been streamlined. For starters, skills have been removed. 
Nothing was added to replace them, so the previous way to differentiate your character and personalize your playstyle is just gone. As for the in-game resources needed to navigate the environment, lockpicks and multi-tools have been combined, so now multi-tools work for everything, which is less satisfying as it feels like you're always using the same item for every problem. Multi-tools themselves are given out quite generously, particularly once you get to Cairo, which is about a third of the way through the game, where for reasons I don't understand, there's just a huge pile of multi-tools on the floor in the middle of the mosque. So from this point onwards you'll never be short on multi-tools again, and I don't understand why these multi-tools are even here in the first place, and whether or not this is a bug, but it sure seems different to the first game where these types of items remained valuable for your entire playthrough. Other resources like health restoration items and energy cells are also too common, and even on the hardest difficulty, you'll get far more of these than you can ever realistically use. One of the most valuable items you could find in the previous game were augmentation canisters, but now Invisible War makes nearly all augmentations available during the game's opening, instead of making the player acquire them as you progress through the game. Augmentation upgrade items do make a return, but just like most other items, you'll come by them too frequently, as Invisible War likes to give them out like they're cheap candy at Christmas. These items are the only real progression system left in the game, now that skill points are no longer a thing, but as soon as I got to Germany, which is around the halfway mark, I found I had finished upgrading every augment I had. I feel I should point out, but I didn't go out of my way to find these items, so there's probably plenty I missed, yet I still effectively had enough to be completely finished with them when the game was only halfway done. This is like getting to max level in a game by the midway point, which doesn't exactly make subsequent upgrade items you find feel very meaningful. There's a broader point I want to make with all these examples I've just mentioned though, which is that all of these items previously acted as rewards for exploration, and so by devaluing these things, Invisible War also ensures that exploration itself becomes less valuable as well. The one item you may find yourself in short supply of is ammo. For some reason, ammo has been changed to be universal, meaning there's only one type of ammo you pick up, which is used for every weapon in-game. As ammo is scarce and some weapons burn through it quicker than others, this encourages you to use a smaller variety of weapons. Invisible War's obsession with corridors also doesn't lend itself well to rewarding weapon variety, as a sniper rifle isn't much use if you never find yourself at long range. And while I'm back to complaining about the corridors again, I also feel it's worth pointing out that these environments don't make for very exciting shooting galleries. You could say the first game's large open environments weren't much better in this regard, and you'd be right. But with so much of its mechanics stripped down or streamlined, Invisible War ends up reliant on its core gunplay to at least be better than the low bar of its predecessor. And to its credit, it probably is. The aiming reticule is no longer a reluctant participant to the gameplay, making the basic act of shooting enemies a bit closer to what you might expect from an FPS, and there's still a range of different weapons that can be modified, so if the only thing you do care about is shooting your way through a level, then Invisible War probably meets your needs better than the first Deus Ex. But at the same time, if all you wanted was a pure FPS, there's no need to play a Deus Ex game in the first place, and as soon as you start to compare Invisible War to other FPS games of the same era, it starts to seem lacking. This is because enemies are bullet sponges, their AI is light on common sense, weapons aren't very weighty, and you don't even need to reload in this game. Another important part of the first Deus Ex's gameplay that had room for improvement was stealth but in this area, Invisible War barely even tries. To start with, your means of incapacitating foes without being detective is even more lacking than it was last game. Headshots don't kill in one, and trying to take down foes in melee is unreliable. There is a solution though, which is the cloaking augmentation. Unlike in the first game where this was only attainable quite late on, in Invisible War you get this augmentation, along with most others, right at the opening section. And Invisible War reduces the energy requirement to use this augmentation, while also making energy in general easier to come by. You also had to make a choice in the last game whether to install a cloaking augment that was only effective against humans, or only effective against mechanical enemies, 
meaning you could never rely solely on cloaking to get past everything. Now though, that's no longer the case, so the cloaking augment works in all situations. Finally, in the last game, you still had to be careful when cloaked about making noise. In Invisible War though, you can make as much noise as you like, and you can even take it further by bumping straight into enemies, and they still won't know you're there. So, after all these changes, it's probably no surprise to learn that the cloaking augmentation is completely overpowered. And you can, if you choose, use cloaking to run through most levels in the game without any real problems if that's how you want to play. In the first Deus Ex, stealth is a valuable tool at your disposal that you're rewarded for taking advantage of. In Invisible War, stealth is borderline useless without the cloaking augment, and with this augment it's completely broken to the point where you can just bypass large sections of the game. So in terms of gameplay, Invisible War is similar, but worse, and while some of this can be blamed on the shift to console and the limitations that came with this, other parts are just bad design, which leaves the story with a lot of work to do to make this a worthy sequel. Invisible War opens with a cutscene that shows much more impressive visuals than anything in the first game, but that's about the only good thing about it. In this cinematic, a terrorist uses a nanite bomb to blow up the city of Chicago. The first time I saw this, I had no idea what was actually happening. It looked like everything was being turned to stone, and after googling nanite bomb and finding out that this isn't actually a real thing, I've decided to blame my lack of understanding on the game. More importantly, this cutscene establishes the tone of the story and setting, and while the first game offered a mostly grounded vision of a near-future dystopia, that's all pretty much went out the window now, and instead Invisible War takes an approach that's closer to a pulpy sci-fi adventure. I want to point out here that the aliens are back, and now they also talk to you and play a much larger role in the story, even though that role isn't at all necessary. I'm not going to mention this again, as I'd rather just get it out of the way now, but I do want to make it clear that the presence of aliens is stupid, and if I see even one alien apologist in the comment section of this video, I'm going to be very disappointed in you. Anyway, Invisible War is set 20 years after the previous game, and you play as Alex D, another augmented human who will later turn out to be a clone of JC Denton. Alex was previously undertaking training at an elite academy in Chicago before the terrorist attack forced him to flee. Alex is rocking that early 2000s boy band look, which doesn't do him any favours, and really, Alex gets more shit than he deserves for his spiky gelled hair. I mean, hey, we all went through the early 2000s, no judgement here. But dated as his design might be, I think the reason everyone focuses so much on his hairdo is probably because it's the most noteworthy thing about him. His personality is bland, and I don't want to overly romanticise JC, but you'll soon be missing his deadpan delivery, because at least he had some semblance of an identifiable personality. If dialogue allowed more room to roleplay, maybe this would make sense, but it doesn't, and so Alex just seems weak. Anyway, like it or not, Alex is who you're stuck with, and after travelling from Chicago to Seattle before the game's opening, he finds his new academy attacked by a terrorist group for the second time this week. The group responsible is the Knight Templars, who are a vaguely fascist organisation that consider all bio-augmentation to be evil and see augmented individuals as impure. Factions play a much larger role in this game than the first Deus Ex, and once you escape the academy and move on to the city of Seattle proper, you'll be introduced to the other two main groups. The first of which is the World Trade Organization, who have become the acting de facto government body and seem to protect the status quo, and the other is the Order, a widespread religious group who have somehow managed to replace and combine all organised religions, and yet don't seem to have much of an ideology. They talk a bit about natural balance, and that augmentation use might be bad, and that capitalism and corporations might also be bad, but they're vague on details, and it would be hard to blame anyone who just sees any of these three factions as generic and shallow. There is one other group who are more interesting, which is the Omar. 
This heavily augmented group of cyborgs just seem to want to trade illegal weaponry, but their mysteriousness adds some degree of intrigue, and that's more that can be said about any of the other groups. It's unfortunate then that the Omar don't feature more often, leaving them seeming as poorly developed as the others. Still, poor as these factions might be, the story will frequently ask you to make choices between them, none of which have any real impact on the narrative, as right up until the very ending you can still work for whichever group you choose, regardless of your previous actions. This shift in focus towards factions isn't a bad thing in itself, but the factions themselves don't feel strong enough to make this approach work. This change does provide more regular narrative choice than the first game, but the choices are also more conventional now. Generally I tended to just side with the WTO, but more by process of elimination than any actual feeling of allegiance. I suppose it has only been 20 years since the last game ended, and everything looks way more futuristic and less fucked up now, so maybe the WTO are doing something right. But really, the others just don't seem like very viable options, as the Knight Templars will always hate you for being augmented, and the vagueness of the Order just make them seem like a cult. Still, no matter what you do, you'll be caught up in the growing conflict between the WTO, the Order, and the Knights Templars, which will take you from Seattle to Cairo to Germany. These hub areas have a greater focus on side content than the last game, and while their visual design isn't especially impressive, it's still nice to be able to explore these areas and see a bit more about what normal life is like in this setting. The side quests aren't great, and the logic behind why Alex is getting involved with them can be shaky, but at least the side quest chain with the rival coffee shop and the AI idol do provide some narrative payoff if you see them through to the end. As for the main story, events lead Alex to investigate the group behind his training academy, who are called Apostle Corp. This eventually leads Alex to Germany, where he meets the Apostle Corp leader, Tracer Tong, who wants Alex to go to Antarctica to find JC Denton. Before Alex can do this, he finds out that the World Trade Organization and the Order are actually both puppet organizations that are being controlled by the Illuminati, who have been deliberately engineering a fake conflict between the two groups as part of their plan to control the populace. You go to Antarctica and revive JC, and around about now you might be wondering which of the last game's endings was canon. They were pretty different, and this detail obviously matters, but the answer to that question is… all of them. So somehow after the events of the last game, the Illuminati regained power, JC merged with Helios, and a global economic and technological setback occurred, known as the Collapse. I don't think trying to make all three endings canon was the right solution to the writer's problem of which ending do we choose, but I have to admit, there is something I respect about the audacity of this all, where the writers have just tried to brute force all three endings and pretend that this all makes perfect sense. And it almost does. Anyway, after you save JC, he explains his plan about merging himself with all of humanity using biomods to create what he calls a perfect democracy. The final location in the game is Liberty Island, where you get to explore the old Unatco base, and where Alex must decide whether to side with JC and Apostle Corp, or the Illuminati who want to run the world themselves, or the Knights Templars who want to end all biomodification. You can also choose to work with the Omar to kill all the other factions, which ends up turning the world into a desolate wasteland dominated by the Omar. These four options feel a bit like a retread of the previous game's ending choice. You can once more side with either the Illuminati, or put your faith in the JC AI hybrid, or take an extreme anti-technology option. As the Illuminati's persistent manipulations doesn't present them in a very positive light, and the Knight Templar's violent extremism seems even worse, this doesn't make the final choice especially compelling, and I'm pretty sure almost every player will just side with JC here as a result. His idea of a perfect democracy sure sounds better than anything else being promised, and that's before accounting for the player's likely loyalty to him as a result of the last game. I do like that you can choose not to side with any group and try to kill them all instead by working with the Omar, but the Omar themselves don't provide any argument for why you should support them. 
As a group, they represent a transhumanist option through their use of technology to surpass human limitations, but this isn't communicated much in game, as pretty much all your interaction with them just revolves around their black market activities. As for the Illuminati, the twist that they actually control both the WTO and the Order does at least explain why each group seems so generic, but this still leaves the question of how they managed to do this in the first place. It doesn't sound like an easy task to replace all world religions and governments, particularly as 20 years ago the Illuminati were all but destroyed, and yet the question of how the Illuminati did this is left largely unexplored, despite this arguably being the most interesting thing about them. Then there's the Knights Templars, whose extremism barely makes them worth mentioning. An anti-augmentation group could have worked, but they would need to be toned down several degrees if the player was meant to consider siding with them, or giving much credence to their ideology. Another issue with this ending is how some parts of it contradict what we see in the previous game. The Helios ending in the first Deus Ex was about JC merging with Helios to rule the world as a super powerful human AI dictator. Yet now choosing this path is about merging with all of humanity to create some connected consciousness to form a perfect democracy. And the ideological difference between a democracy and a dictatorship seems pretty significant. Then you have Tracer Tong, who previously wanted to destroy all advanced technology and plunge the world into a new dark age, but now wants you to help JC merge with all of humanity to create a single shared consciousness. Characters can change, but this still doesn't seem very consistent, and if the story had to feature JC, Paul, and Tong, I think it would have been much better if each of these returning characters presented their own distinct option for the player to consider. This way, people wouldn't just end up siding with the returning characters they know and like, and it may have also forced the writers to take a less black and white approach. Instead, Invisible War's story ends up feeling like it has a few good ideas, but has very little to say about them, and I find it hard not to see it as a disappointing follow-up to a much better previous game. It's also a lot shorter, being about half the length of the first Deus Ex, with less than half the replayability. The most positive thing you can say about this game is that just because it's worse doesn't mean it's bad, and this is true. Invisible War is by no means a terrible game. It shares many of the positive qualities of the game that inspired it, they just shine far less brightly this time around. Still I find it hard to be positive about a sequel, where the best you can say about it is that it's similar but worse, and really I'd rather have a game that tries to do its own thing, even if that means it won't always be successful. And as it turned out, the next developers who would tackle this series seemed to agree. After Invisible War, multiple attempts were made to develop a sequel, but Iron Storm eventually shut down in 2005. Parent company Eidos Interactive would go on to be purchased by Square Enix, with the series being continued by the newly formed studio Eidos Montreal. The result was Deus Ex Human Revolution, which released in 2011 to critical and commercial success. It was Eidos Montreal's first game, and the development team was formed almost entirely of newcomers to the series, but much about the game would stay true to those that came before. Not everything though. Where Invisible War was a faithful if ultimately more forgettable follow-up, Human Revolution felt more like a reimagining. Set 25 years before the first game, it used its status as a prequel to provide itself with greater creative freedom in how it would approach this universe. While in terms of gameplay this meant it would be a modernisation of the same Deus Ex formula of the first game, stylistically, Human Revolution would be something else entirely. It should be acknowledged that there are a number of older fans of the series who did not appreciate the direction Eidos Montreal went with the game's visuals, but I am not one of them. In truth, I think the new art style is great. I love the simple but striking colour palette, with its heavy reliance on blacks and golds, giving the game a mood that's hard to pin down. Sometimes warm and inviting, but other times ostentatious and decadent, or metallic and uncaring. I love the overly designed fashion choices, with their intricate renaissance theme detailing and unconventional geometry, and I love the urban environments, as unrealistically achievable in such a time frame as they might be. In short, I love the aesthetics of this world, even if they're not in line with the first game. 
and maybe in some ways even because of this. I've never been much of a fan of sequels that are just content to do the same as what came before, riding their predecessors' coattails to avoid facing the accountability of originality. And as sensible as many of the arguments levied against this game's visuals may be, you won't be hearing them from me. Hell, I even like the gold filter that so many people complained about. So much so that I actually modded the director's cut version of the game, which normally has the filter removed, just to add it back in. And that brings me to something else worth addressing. There is both a director's cut and an original version of this game, and each has their own problems. If you don't own the game, you won't have to worry about which version to buy, because you don't have a choice. The director's cut is the only one available. However, the director's cut is a port of the Wii U version of the game, which means the graphics aren't actually improved in any significant way, plus it has some bugs that apparently weren't present before, and the original game's gold filter has been removed and the lighting altered. The director's cut does bring slightly improved boss fights, and the automatic integration of the DLC, but even this might have a downside because the DLC takes place towards the end of the main story, and there's no way to avoid this lengthy interruption for anyone that doesn't want to do it. Which may be the case if you're replaying the game, and don't want this optional extra content. Meanwhile, if you owned the original game and were happy to stick with it, but still wanted to play the DLC, you'd be out of luck again, because there's no way to purchase the DLC for the original game anymore, meaning you're forced to buy the whole game again through the director's cut to play the DLC that way. This whole situation is a bit of a mess, and something like this shouldn't happen in the first place. A director's cut should be an objective improvement on the original, and if it's not, it shouldn't even be released. Meanwhile, options to buy DLC should be added to online stores so that people who purchased your game when it first came out aren't excluded from content they'd otherwise be willing to pay for. As for the gold filter itself, this is exactly the type of feature the player should have been able to toggle on and off in the options in the first place. Yet, not only did the original make a mistake by not giving players this option to turn it off, the director's cut then makes the same mistake by not giving players the option to turn it back on. This will all tie into a broader question later about the management of this series, but for now let's get back to the actual game. Alongside the visuals, there was also a change in focus for the narrative. Where the first two games were mostly concerned with secret societies and government agencies, with the rest of society being pushed more into the background, Human Revolution instead does the opposite, with the new focus placed firmly on society and its response to the recently pioneered technology known as augmentations. The secret societies are still here, but you won't be seeing them as much anymore, and I think this shift in focus works quite well, as the ethics and consequences of augmentation is an issue that allows plenty room for exploration. In some ways, this new focus on technology can make Human Revolution seem more sci-fi than the first game, despite being set 25 years earlier, although there are other ways it comes across as more grounded, like the absence of little grey aliens and a toning down of the present day conspiracies. Surprisingly, gameplay is probably what changed the least, although this is still a game released more than 10 years after the first, and that's clearly evident in the design. Despite this, Human Revolution might end up feeling like less of a casualization of the series than the last game was. A lot of the features you'd expect to return do, including, thankfully, the grid-based inventory and different ammunition types. There's still no skill system, but augmentations are back, with plenty of options to choose from, and the level design is closer to the original in terms of complexity. Of course, being closer doesn't make it its equal, and the first game is still the clear winner on the basis of number of options available and freedom given to the player. But Human Revolution is a clear step up from Invisible War, and even if the environments are simpler than the first game, they at least try to make up for this by looking a lot better and featuring a greater amount of detail and variety. One issue that returns is how Human Revolution handles hacking. Where the first Deus Ex made locks, computers and electronics all distinct things, Human Revolution instead has everything handled by hacking. To hack something, there's a reasonably involved minigame, which looks like this. The minigame isn't something I want to go into in too much detail, because overall it's not bad, despite the reliance on RNG. I do feel it's worth pointing out, however, that you'll be hacking things so often that if you don't like this minigame, then you'll damn sure get pretty sick of it. 
Also, when you fail several times, you're locked out for 30 seconds, which is just a waste of time. Either give failure a real consequence, like setting off an enemy alarm or permanently locking you out of hacking something, or let me retry right away. Forcing players to wait 30 seconds achieves nothing except for being an annoyance. It reminds me of how in the first Deus Ex, when you restore your energy at a robot, it only restores 75%. For the other 25%, you have to wait an extra 60 seconds for the robot to recharge so you can use it again. And I'd just like to ask, whose idea was this? Seriously, I want a name. 60 seconds adds up, and too much of my life has been spent waiting on this stupid robot to hurry the fuck up and recharge the rest of my energy. Anyway, the hacking minigame in Human Revolution itself is generally fine. It's just this game has the same problem that the first Deus Ex had, which is that hacking still makes the in-game codes you find a little pointless. You can choose not to level hacking up, but so much in the game is hackable that I think increasing your hacking rating ends up seeming like one of the most valuable augments there is, and after increasing this, you'll never need an in-game code again. Finding codes through searching the environment was a good part of the series, so it's a shame hacking once more makes it often irrelevant, and hacking even gives you greater XP reward than inputting the code manually, meaning even if you do find a code, you may prefer to hack an object anyway. The next game does add an XP reward for using codes, so at least it's only this game where you're punished for not hacking, but I still think it may have been better if the XP reward was removed and hacking was made to require something like an easy to find consumable akin to the first game's lockpicks and multi-tools. This would reduce the amount of hacking in-game, so the quantity of hacking isn't quite so overwhelming, while turning whether to hack something or not into more of a meaningful decision, rather than just being the player's automatic response to every hackable object they find. As for your other augments, despite looking like a lot, many are just connected to hacking, so the overall amount of choice isn't quite as impressive as it may first appear but I still think Human Revolution manages to have enough different options to allow players to customise their build in meaningful ways. Augments can loosely be split into three different categories, combat, stealth and hacking, and at least for most of the game, players won't be able to get everything they want, forcing them to consider what abilities matter for their playstyle. Something many people complained about, particularly at the time of release, was the presence of boss fights. They argued, often quite loudly, that featuring combat-focused boss fights in a game that let you choose to play a non-combat-focused character was unfair. This is something I disagree with completely. The point of introducing choices, whether in character building or otherwise, is to create consequences. The consequence of creating a non-combat-focused character is that sometimes you might be forced into a combat scenario, and then you'll be at a disadvantage. This is choice and consequence working as intended, and it's not like there aren't positive consequences to non-combat characters to offset this. Negative consequences themselves aren't bad game design, they're a necessary part of the system, and the idea that giving players choices should mean the game always caters to their selections is ridiculous. As for the actual concept of boss fights being something players take issue with, the first game had them too, and I don't see what's wrong with them returning. The fights themselves aren't anything special in Human Revolution, but they certainly aren't bad enough to justify the hate they received, and when augmentation upgrades are given out a bit too freely anyway, these boss fights actually end up serving a useful purpose by making a greater number of augmentations feel valuable. As for the core gameplay, modernization does have some advantages, like improved shooting. The cover system feels like a sign of the era this game was developed in, where cover systems were the hot new trend, but as cover systems go it does its job well enough, and thankfully enemies have been given high enough damage and a short enough delay in their aim time to make shooting your way through every encounter still a challenge. This is important because it stays true to the original game, and provides an incentive for players to try stealth. Enemy competency also helps the game stay grounded, meaning it comes off as more tactical shooter than pure power fantasy. As for stealth itself, you now have a mini-map, which even with no other upgrades provides more information about enemy movements than before, meaning sneaking your way through levels without abusing quick saving is more manageable. Enemies are less visually impaired than before, so stealth isn't overly easy. 
but the downside to using the minimap like this is that it doesn't make for very exciting gameplay when the player gets so much information by staring at a little box in the corner of their screen, and your reliance on this can feel cheap. You can also take enemies down silently in melee now with a single button press. The animations for these takedowns look good, but you might find pausing to watch them so frequently breaks the flow of gameplay. Takedowns in Human Revolution cost energy, which limits the frequency you can perform them, but the energy system itself has also changed. You still spend energy to use certain augments, with a takedown costing one bar, but your first bar of energy now recharges over time. This forces you to space out your takedowns and augment usage, but having only one bar of energy recharge feels like poor design. For starters, it artificially slows you down by forcing you to wait in cover for your energy to recharge, which isn't very interesting. It also means that once more the cloaking augment is a little too strong, as even if it can only be used for a short time, as long as you don't mind waiting for your energy to recharge, you can still hop unseen from one bit of cover to the next, which, while an improvement on Invisible War, still makes navigating levels this way overly simple. Another problem with only having one bar recharge is that it makes upgrading your total energy through augmentations completely pointless, as no matter what your maximum energy is, your effective energy in most situations will still be limited to the first bar. It would have been better if Human Revolution had committed to either having all energy recharge, or no energy recharge with no energy cost for takedowns. Both of these would require balance adjustments, but the current system of only one bar recharging feels arbitrary and introduces its own problems anyway. Still, for the most part, both combat and stealth work well. Human Revolution may still be a bit too easy though, but the reason for this is something else entirely. A big part of the first Deus Ex was exploration. That's still the case this time round, but in sticking with modern game tradition, Human Revolution introduces both quest markers and a fully detailed map, the combination of which is overkill. There's one mission towards the end of the game where quest markers are disabled as a result of an enemy jammer in the area. Taking out the enemy jammer is an optional objective, alongside your main objective of finding some scientists who are held in different parts of the enemy complex. If you do take out the jammer, you'll get quest markers for the scientists, but ignore the jammer and you'll have to carefully explore this place on your own. You can look at your main map to try to work out where the scientists may be held and plan out your route between areas, but most importantly, you will explore. Because you have to. This is the best section in the game in my opinion, and it's what the series' gameplay should be, but you wouldn't even experience this if you don't ignore the optional objective or get lucky enough to not find it. Modern games have embraced minimaps and quest markers, but they don't work as well in a game that's meant to focus on exploration. Human Revolution still has interesting levels, with multiple paths through them, but yet it wants to hold your hand the entire time when really most players are old enough to tackle such things on their own. You can turn objective markers off in the options, although they're still on in the game's hardest difficulty by default, and many players either won't realise they can be turned off in the first place, or won't realise the game might be more enjoyable if they do so. There's also times where quest markers can be useful, particularly for some less important side quests in hub areas where you might be walking back and forth quite a lot. And even if Human Revolution allows you to turn quest markers off, that doesn't mean it's designed to still give you all the information you need to do so without occasional moments of frustration. Still, as it is by default, quest markers hinder the game from reaching its full potential by pointing you in the exact direction you need to go when finding this out should be part of the fun. It's really the combination of quest markers and the detailed map that make it too much though. With these two tools, you don't just see where to go, you often see exactly how to get there as well, and despite having larger levels, the first Deus Ex was still just fine without either. The approach I think Human Revolution should have taken is to use situational implementation of these tools. For objectives where your character should know how to reach them, like returning to an NPC who gave you a side quest a little while earlier, then it makes sense that this is knowledge the player's character should have, so why not have a quest marker? But for information that there's no way your character would have, like where is an item in an enemy military base you're infiltrating, then there shouldn't be a marker and players should have to find this out themselves. 
This could benefit gameplay, while also being more immersive and preventing frustration in areas of less importance where markers could remain. And the game could take the exact same approach with the map. This way you can give players a fully detailed map when it makes sense, but not in areas it doesn't, which could be beneficial for the same reason as selectively removing quest markers, while also providing a bit of variety by changing up what information the player has access to. You could even have maps act as an additional reward for exploration in certain areas by making players start the area with no map, and then be able to find one through something like security terminals. This could be explained in game by these terminals having the building layout on them, which your character could then upload through their augmentations. And you could even do the same for quest markers by making them show up if players learn key information, like maybe by overhearing NPC conversations. And this way players who do get lost have an increased chance to find extra information that could in return allow them to find where to go, so the chance of anyone actually getting stuck for a long time is lowered. This might all sound a little overly ambitious, but really I don't think it is, and in a game that's meant to prioritise player freedom and exploration, the effort this would take would be worth it in my opinion. Ultimately, Human Revolution and the later follow-up Mankind Divided have a difficulty setting called Give Me Deus Ex, but I don't think they quite do this, and this is why. Despite this, the gameplay ingredients needed for a great Deus Ex game are all here, and the end result does come very close, but Eidos Montreal have lost a little bit of what made the original so great in their attempt to modernise the series. There are things Human Revolution does better than the first game, like its shooting, enemy AI, the visual variety of its environments, or the much more interesting hub areas, and there's also a lot more to like about the story this time round than the last effort. As for that story, it begins with a trailer. I mean, it doesn't really, but it probably should because this cinematic trailer is a better introduction to the narrative than the actual opening, and it shows an important part of the main character that the rest of the game often forgets. That character is Adam Jensen, a man with a distractingly pointy chin whose voice is so gravelly it could give Christian Bale's Batman a run for his money. Jensen is the head of security at Sarif Industries, a leading biotech company on the cusp of a breakthrough that would allow a new type of body augmentation where recipients are no longer reliant on an expensive anti-rejection drug called neuropazine. But before this research can be completed, a group of augmented soldiers attack Sarif Industries, killing the team of scientists involved in this research, including Jensen's girlfriend, and leaving Jensen himself near death. The CEO of the company, David Sarif, then saves Jensen's life through heavy augmentation, transforming him into a half-machine super soldier. The narrative of human revolution is about augmentation. In this world, this is a relatively new advancement, and the game explores the ethics and impacts of this new technological frontier, which is why I mentioned the cinematic trailer. Jensen himself is a great conduit to explore these issues, in part because he never asked for this. But also because in the game's opening he fails at his job, and at protecting himself and the person he cares most about, because he wasn't augmented and went up against an opposition that was. He then finds himself in the strange position of not just having his life saved, but through this becoming a tool of the corporation who saved him. This is a great premise. In just this opening, the player is shown the advantages of augmentation and some of the risks that come with it. There's a lot that could be explored through Jensen's role in this story, which is why I like the cinematic trailer so much. In it, we get a rare glimpse into what this character is experiencing. We see his recurring dream where he finds himself as Icarus flying too close to the sun, which reflects his fears on augmentation, and we also see the difficulty he has adjusting to his new body by the way he accidentally breaks a whiskey glass, in an act where his unfamiliarity with his own body causes him to fail at something normally so simple, which also highlights his superhuman strength as if to signpost its potential danger. It's not a bad trailer, and I can't help but think that there's a great story waiting to be told here about an individual who's thrust into a new body in a new world as they struggle with the ethical and societal implications of what this means to them. That's not what human revolution is though. Make no mistake, this game is all about augmentation, perhaps to the point where it takes it too far, 
Everywhere you go in this world, it feels like augmentations are the only thing anyone cares about. They're in every news story and readable piece of side content, they're the topic of conversations you overhear on the street, and they're the main story's main focus. It gets to the point where it's a bit much, and it can feel like you're being hit over the head by a message you are already well aware of. I remember when I first got to Jensen's apartment building, where I overheard a conversation between his neighbours who were discussing their relationship problems, and I thought to myself how strange it was to hear someone in this game finally talk about a subject other than augmentation. And then it turns out the reason for their argument was that the woman cheated on the man because she, quote, wanted to be reminded of what it was like to be with someone normal. So even this was all about augments. And that was the point where Human Revolution's obsession with augmentation really started to feel like it was undermining the authenticity of the setting in my eyes. It's one thing to want to explore a particular topic in your game, it's another to do so to such a degree that the setting starts to feel like it's being reduced to a single subject. And there are other problems with how this game tackles augmentation as well, but we'll get to that later. To continue with the story, once Jensen recovers and returns to work for Sarif Industries, he's sent in to deal with a group of anti-augmentation extremists, which leads him onto the trail of the mysterious group responsible for the original attack. Jensen follows this trail from Detroit to the newly built Chinese megacity of Hengsha, where he learns that the attack is connected to a powerful organisation that control global interests from the shadows. During this, anti-augmentation riots break out across the globe. Jensen continues to unpick at this conspiracy, uncovering certain details about his own past, as well as knowledge that the scientists who were kidnapped in the game's opening, who were previously presumed dead, are in fact alive. Jensen rescues them, but before he can finally confront the group responsible, the world is thrown into chaos when a man named Hugh Darrow, a billionaire philanthropist known as the father of augmentation for the role he played in their development, emits a signal during a live television broadcast which makes every augmented individual with a recently installed biochip enter into a murderous frenzy. Hugh Darrow was once a believer in an augmented future, who saw his invention as something that could help the less fortunate, but he since became disillusioned, due in large part to the way he saw his technology evolve into a tool for the powerful to spread their influence. The group behind the attack at the start of the game, that the player has spent all this time pursuing, is the Illuminati. Darrow is aware of the Illuminati, and he's not wrong about what they're doing. In fact, you can find several allusions to both the Illuminati's questionable methodology, as well as details featured in other games in the series, including information about the creation of the Grey Death, the development of a kill switch that will later be installed into augmented individuals, and the epilogue even mentions a Project D, which surely refers to the creation of JC and other Dentons, and implies that this was made possible by the use of Jensen's genetic code. A detail that may have been more surprising if the writers didn't name him Adam. Anyway, the Illuminati are the main antagonists of this story, and yet it was a man acting against them who ultimately does something truly terrible. The signal making everyone insane part of this story feels a little far-fetched, but the rest of it is generally very well told. There's a lot of detail this summary has omitted, but for the most part Human Revolution is an engaging conspiracy thriller with good presentation that makes it easy to get invested in. It's the way this story handles its themes, and ending, that ultimately let it down however. Human Revolution is about augmentation. It explores transhumanist questions about right and wrong, power and control, change and resistance, and this is a great subject for the series, but Human Revolution doesn't quite do it justice. I think the biggest problem with how augmentation is handled in this game is that it's displayed in such a video game centric way, as if the reason augmentations are important is because they make for really sweet power-ups that you can use to beat people up. But really, the great thing about augmentations isn't that you can get swords installed in your arms. In fact, outside of some very rare circumstances, being better at fighting people or infiltrating top secret enemy bases isn't a major part of most people's lives. Which begs the questions of 1. Why do so many people care about augmentation to the point they're willing to riot? And two, why are people choosing to get augmented in the first place? I mean, I can understand why someone might want to enhance their physical capabilities. If you ask me if I'd like superpowers, 
the answer would probably be yes. I mean, I don't need superpowers or anything, but I guess they couldn't hurt. Unless, to get those superpowers, I had to have my limbs surgically removed. That might hurt quite a lot, and suddenly faced with that prospect, those unnecessary superpowers don't seem quite so appealing. And that's before considering the high price of installation, which is made even worse by the need to keep taking the expensive immunosuppressant neuropazine. And the fact there's a possibility of something going wrong, which is pretty common with new technology, and does end up being exactly what happens in-game. And with all these factors taken into consideration, it ends up hard to see what the appeal of augmentations are, unless you're someone already unlucky enough to have a physical disability. Hidden swords installed in your arms might make for a neat party trick, but they hardly seem worth the downsides. But maybe augmentation is meant to be more than this. There's one side quest in this game where you go to collect the debt from a woman who went to the triad to fund her brain augmentation. She says she needed the augment to be able to compete at her job as a financial broker, and that most other brokers come from rich families, so they buy augmentations to get an edge in the business world. This conversation frames augments as a way for the rich to get richer, which would explain why some people are so against augmentation, because of the unfair advantage to those that can afford it, which disadvantages everyone else. This side quest also shows a side to augment outside of combat ability, which is otherwise never expanded upon and never even seen by the player except for Jensen's social enhancer augment. So, this side quest does suggest why augments are so important, and yet this is just a couple lines of optional dialogue. For the rest of the game, I don't recall the topic of augments affecting employability, or augmentations benefiting the rich, ever featuring again. And so, there is a side to this technology that clearly matters, but the game barely touches upon it, and, as it is, the widespread adoption of augmentations doesn't feel like it's really justified. The end result is that the exploration of augmentation as a transhumanist issue doesn't feel very deep. This subject also could have been examined through looking at Jensen himself, but despite the tone set by the trailer, Jensen receives little actual development, and the impact of augmentation on his own life is never made a focus. Of course, this is an RPG, so there should be room for the player to determine how Jensen acts, which there is. There are many more dialogue choices in this game than the last two, and they're handled quite well, with clever UI design which shows both a short version of your response, while also letting you see the exact wording, so you always know what you're choosing. But despite this, the game doesn't really try to allow the player to express much of their own opinion on augmentation, as Jensen is so focused on getting down to business and busting global conspiracies, but there isn't any room left for introspection. There is one exception to this, which is the ending. In true Deus Ex fashion, human revolution ends with a choice. After stopping Darrow and shutting down the signal, Jensen must decide what to broadcast to the world. His options are to broadcast the truth, which will turn humanity against augmentation, or blame an anti-augmentation group called Humanity Front for the signal, at the request of David Saraf, which will allow augmentation technology to continue to develop, or instead to broadcast an excuse about contaminated neuropazine at the request of the Illuminati to further their control. There is one other option, which is to avoid choosing by committing suicide so that no one can spin the story. This doesn't make much sense, because committing suicide doesn't actually prevent someone else from spinning the story, and surely you can avoid making a choice by just not making a choice. Why does suicide even need to be included? It's like the world's worst package deal. For a limited time only, take the avoid making a choice option, and we'll throw in a free side of kill yourself, all for no extra charge. There are other problems with this ending as well though. Firstly, this choice is just about which button to press, and I mean that literally, there are actual buttons to press in-game. This makes the choice seem lazy and tacked on, which it is, and even in the first game this was handled better by having different gameplay sections for each choice, so it at least seemed less like picking A, B or C from a list. Then there are the end cutscenes themselves, where Jensen monologues over some imagery which, while not terrible, still seems like a clear missed opportunity when the game could have ended with the actual broadcast. I mean, that's what we're choosing here, what to broadcast to the world, so why not end it by showing what the rest of the world is meant to be seeing? 
then there's the problem with how this game is asking you to choose a consequence, not an action. Decisions in games should be about what to do. The consequence of that decision should be unknown. You may be able to guess what the consequence will be, but that should still just be a guess. Human Revolution instead tells you the consequence of each action, and asks you to choose based on that. So instead of framing this choice as whether to tell the world the truth, or blame it on the anti-augmentation group, or broadcast the Illuminati's made-up excuse, it's instead framed as whether to turn everyone against augmentation, or manipulate people into being pro-augmentation, or just protect the status quo. What makes this so jarring is that if given the choice between telling the world the truth and hiding the truth, I think most people would opt for the truth. But if given a choice between turning the world pro or anti-augmentation, most would choose pro. And yet, telling the truth and turning the world against augmentation are treated as the exact same. This doesn't even make much sense to me. I wouldn't expect the consequence of exposing the truth about the Illuminati and Darrow's actions to be that the world becomes anti-augmentation. I'd expect it would make the world anti-Illuminati and anti-Darrow. And while I'm not saying it's not possible that the truth turns people away from augments, it's still very strange to be told to make a choice this way because the game tells you the consequence, but the consequence doesn't match my interpretation of the choice. There are other ways Human Revolution actually does choice well. There's lots of reactivity to some of the decisions you make during the story, there are several persuasion events, which might be too easy but still feel like a good effort to do something more with dialogue speech checks, and there's even some hidden choices reminiscent of the first game, like about how your actions during a particular gameplay section can save your pilot's life. But the ending choice itself was a real disappointment, and it's a shame that this low point is the last thing players will experience. And so, to sum it all up, the end choice was bad, the themes weren't done justice, and yet I still think the overall story was pretty good, and the gameplay even better. Human Revolution was a much superior game than Invisible War in my eyes, even if it was a bigger departure from the original. When it comes to the gameplay, a lot of effort was made to stay true to the philosophy of the series, but it's in the attempt to modernise the first game that part of its magic ultimately gets lost. Although I am willing to admit that modernisation does have some benefits. And when it comes to the story, Human Revolution did succeed at delivering a new and interesting look at this world that left plenty of room for its themes to be explored further by a sequel. And that is what happened. Sort of. Before we get to that however, I do want to at least mention Deus Ex The Fall, a mobile spin-off entry to the series that was later ported to PC, and is by no means worthy of its own section in this video. The Fall is quite impressive, if viewed solely as a 2013 mobile take on Deus Ex. Otherwise, it's thoroughly forgettable. In terms of gameplay, it's a simplified version of Human Revolution that maybe isn't quite so simplified so as to lose all enjoyableness, but isn't far off. In terms of story, The Fall is set just before Human Revolution and focuses on the Tyrants, the group of augmented soldiers who attacked Seraph Industries at the start of the last game. Really, for a game like this it's up to the story to redeem it, and make playing it feel worthwhile, but that doesn't happen, and it's not even because the story is bad, it's because this game is completely unfinished. The Fall is only around 4 hours long, and as soon as the story's been set up and the characters introduced, it ends. It doesn't contain an actual ending either, you just get in a helicopter to go to the next location and then the credits start rolling. Obviously more sequels must have been planned, but that was not to be. Maybe because nobody wanted a mobile Deus Ex game in the first place, which begs the question of why anyone actually thought this was a good idea. Deus Ex The Fall is a bad game, and while unnecessary spin-offs aren't exclusive to the Deus Ex series, this won't be the only questionable decision made with this series, as we'll soon see. With Human Revolution, Eidos Montreal had created a great foundation to build on, and the sequel, Mankind Divided, would certainly build on parts of it. Released in 2016, this follow-up features some of the best and worst parts of the entire series. Its strongest aspect is its expanded hub area that far surpasses anything seen yet in size, depth and detail, 
but in other ways the flaws of human revolution remain. Mankind Divided's handling of its themes might be even less successful than last time round, while the main story's conclusion leaves many unanswered questions that are made worse by the unanswered question hanging over the series' actual future. But we'll get to that. For now, welcome to Prague. It's 2029, two years since a man named Hugh Darrow tried to bring the world to its knees in an event now referred to as The Incident. And while Darrow may have failed to go all the way, the rest of humanity has nevertheless seen fit to meet him in the middle. In the wake of the chaos that came when the augmented populace of the world lost control of body and mind, society has responded with new discrimination and hatred, leaving no uncertainty over what the title of this game is referring to. Just as human revolution allowed its focus on augmentation to dominate the setting, so too does Mankind Divided, except augmentation is now no longer about transhumanism and the impact of technology, but is instead just a metaphor for racism. I used the word just back then, not because racism itself is a topic I think video games need to avoid, but instead because I wanted to make it clear that those previous things that augmentation allowed the exploration of are no longer a part of this narrative. Really, this is a game about racism, not augmentation, and the role of augmentation is to simply be a stand-in for race. Mankind Divided does feature technology, but it has no interest in looking at racism through the lens of technology, or looking at technology through the lens of racism. Instead, discrimination based on augmentation is used as a substitute for race, and almost every part of this game is designed to focus on this single issue. It's what the main story is about, what most of the side quests are about, what most of the readable documents you find are about, what the structure of the world is about, what the smaller environmental details are about, and what side characters' personalities are about. You may have noticed one thing I didn't mention there is gameplay, but that's about the only exception, as once more from a gameplay perspective, augmentations are awesome. They allow you to carry out your video game centric objectives with much more effectiveness than a normal person ever could, which creates a clear disconnect between narrative and gameplay as every part of Mankind Divided is about how bad it is to be augmented, except for what the player does in the game, which is the opposite. There is one exception to this, which is when you take the train. You do this a lot in Mankind Divided as the train is required to travel to different areas, but the train itself is segregated. This might sound a little heavy handed, and it is and so is the rest of the game, but the great thing about how this is handled is that where you board the train is completely up to you. The first time you use the train you probably won't even realise you can board on different carriages and so will end up in the non-augmented section by mistake. You then have to wait through a loading screen where the other passengers all look at you with suspicion and fear, as you wonder what everyone's problem is. And then it's only after you get off the train and are confronted by an official who reprimands you for using the wrong section that you realise why everyone was looking at you that way in the first place. And then now when you look around the train station again, you'll finally realise that the platform is split into normal and augmented areas and that you were meant to board at the other section. This is great for several reasons. Firstly, it reinforces how arbitrary the divide between the groups is, by the way you don't even notice it until you're confronted. Secondly, it does a better job at allowing the player to experience discrimination than anything else I can think of in a video game. Thirdly, this still allows elements of player choice. It's up to you which section of a train you get on. If you want to rebel against the system by getting on at the wrong part of the platform, you can still do that or you can decide to save yourself the hassle of speaking to the officer every time you travel by getting on with all the other people with augments. The choice is left up to you, and at no point does the game tell you what to do or how you should think about this. And lastly, the final reason why this works so well is it does all this completely naturally just by allowing the player to play the game. When most games want to preach a certain message to their audience, it feels like you're being preached to, which is bad for multiple reasons. But this small part of Mankind Divided achieves what it tries to perfectly, and it deserves a lot of credit for that. Unfortunately, there's nothing else positive to say about Mankind Divided's racism allegory, and a lot that can be said against it. Like how silly the game's made-up terminology is. Augmented individuals are referred to as 
clanks. Calling someone a clank doesn't sound threatening or hateful, it sounds childish. Also, I'm pretty sure augmented individuals don't clank anyway. I mean, I sure don't seem to be making much noise when I walk right up to enemies unheard on my perfectly silent augmented legs. Then there are the slogans in game, like, a wrench is a tool, not a human being. But how is a wrench similar to someone with a mechanical prosthetic? I mean, sure, this slogan is meant to be insensitive and offensive, which I guess it is, but it's also stupid, and I find it hard to believe that this is something people actually say in this world. The way non-augmented people are referred to as naturals is a little better. Naturals is a loaded term, as it implies augmentation is unnatural, and I can just about buy the idea that people might use this language, but it still feels very heavy-handed to hear it all the time and see it used in an official capacity. Then there's the issue of how extreme the discrimination is. This is a world where augmented individuals are being rounded up and put into huge ghettos, where cops aren't interested in investigating a murder of someone if they're augmented because they care so little about an augmented life, where many businesses have banned augmented people from entering their premises, and where the United Nations is about to pass a piece of legislation to force all augmented individuals to have a control chip inserted into them to ensure orgs will always be subservient. Maybe I am too much of an optimist, but really I find the degree of discrimination here hard to believe, when this world is only a few years distant from our own. This is Nazi Germany 2.0, and everyone's just okay with that. But why? The answer to this in-game is that it's the result of the Illuminati, but how have the Illuminati convinced the global population, in just two years, that racism is the best thing since sliced bread? Keep in mind the most anti-augmentation ending of the last game was to broadcast the truth, which included mention of the role of the Illuminati. I know the org incident still happened, and people are going to be more concerned about regulation and restrictions afterwards, but there's a long way from that to pure hate. This event was also the result of a piece of technology going wrong, so I would have thought the anger that followed would be directed at the creators and manufacturers. If, in the future, many people use self-driving cars, and one day they suddenly all go out of control, leading to considerable loss of life, people would be very angry. But wouldn't that anger be directed at the ones who developed these cars and sold the cars and told everyone they're safe, not the drivers who chose to trust them? I'm not saying it's not possible for everyone to now hate people with augments. People can be manipulated, and large groups can adopt bad beliefs but the question of how this happened needs to be answered better in game for this situation to be believable in my eyes. That question also seems like a more interesting focus for the narrative. I think how people are manipulated into being racist is a better subject to explore than what are the consequences of everyone being racist. People already know the answer to the latter, and that question of how still allows you to explore issues surrounding discrimination, while also better connecting to the series' actual themes of power and manipulation. We do get glimpses of this during the main story, but it's not much, and it doesn't address the question of how the world got to this point in the first place. There are also problems with the allegory itself. In Human Revolution, the Augmented were the richer members of society, as augmentation is an expensive procedure, which also requires further cost by way of the regular immunosuppressants people have to take. Being rich and choosing to get your body augmented is not the same as being born with a certain colour of skin, or any other characteristic people don't have an input over. This meant many found the equivalence that mankind divided made between race and augmentation to be offensive. There was even a whole mini-controversy before the game was released, where journalists were angry over the use of the term mechanical apartheid for this reason. And while I don't agree that using the term mechanical apartheid is necessarily a problem, the allegory itself does seem flawed for this general reason. A more accurate fit than augmentation and race would be augmentation and dislike of the 1%. The augmented members of society could be seen as the new bourgeoisie, who are hated by normal people for both their financial and technological privilege, as well as for now obvious risks they pose to society following the org incident. 
For inspiration, the writers could look to the discord that followed in the wake of the 2008 recession, except ramp it up to a far greater extreme. The game could then explore what happens when a large amount of tension exists between a majority with less power and the more wealthy augmented elite. This comparison is a much better fit, and it also returns the series to being about exploring potential questions of the future, as opposed to just being a racism metaphor that has more to say about our past. Obviously, I understand why the game didn't go this route. It's because this would become a complicated subject full of shades of grey that asks difficult questions, whereas a racism allegory is simple and morally black and white. No pun intended. Still, the way Mankind Divided tackles this subject ends up feeling shallow. This game has nothing to say outside of something everyone already knew, which is that racism is bad. Metaphors for racism aren't anything new in fiction, but this one isn't very good, and when you make so much of the game about this, that ends up being a problem. Anyway, there is more to Mankind Divided than this, and having now talked at length about the biggest issue I have with the game, we may as well move on to something more positive, like its most impressive feature, which is the city itself. I could probably spend as long praising this location as I did complaining about the racism allegory. I mean, I won't, but I could, because man, this city is great. Somehow, Eidos Montreal have managed to maintain the heavily stylized approach of the last game while managing to address the biggest criticism of the visuals, which is that they weren't very grounded. The result is that this area manages to capture the best of both worlds, being visually diverse and creative, but still very realistic. The blending of old buildings with modern technology looks great, and honestly, this is exactly how I expect the future to actually look. Still, Prague has more going for it than this. Hub areas have featured in every Deus Ex game, with the role they play growing with each entry. Mankind Divided is no exception, but Eidos Montreal have went above and beyond this time round to expand on everything good about these previous areas. There is a lot to explore here, and many ways to do so. The city is full of secrets, its streets are densely packed with many buildings to enter and pieces of environmental storytelling to uncover. Some locations really require you to think about how to access them, and you can spend hours just exploring and immersing yourself in the world the developers have so skillfully created. When it comes to the level of detail and density of things to find and see, there aren't many games I can think of that come close to this. Of course, this isn't really the Deus Ex experience of the original game, but it still has many similarities like the focus on exploration, multiple paths, and rewards for players who think outside the box. Prague also has some restricted areas which you'll find yourself moving in and out of, meaning the more active parts of the gameplay, like combat and stealth, aren't just divorced from this part of the game, but are instead interwoven. It's a very effective approach to world design, and Mankind Divided also has some great side quests, which further take advantage of this rich and very well realised environment. In other ways, Mankind Divided is a similar game to Human Revolution, but there are some minor improvements like to the cover system, which now allows you to move from one piece of cover to the next more smoothly. Or in the number of augments available, which has been increased quite a bit, although not all of the new additions are especially useful. Or to the stealth system, which gives better warning of when the player is about to be seen, making the still omniscient minimap a little over the top. Then there are some beneficial balance changes, like to the persuasion events, which are now much more likely to fail. The last game was designed to be too forgiving, meaning if you picked options at random then your success was still mathematically very likely, but now failure feels tuned to where it should be, giving these persuasion events the tension they should have had in the first place. Still, more noteworthy might be what hasn't improved, like the level design of the story sections where the game still insists on holding the player's hand the whole time. As impressive as Prague is to explore, nowhere else in the game comes close to it in size or complexity, and a lot of the other areas you do go to feel a bit too short and safe. One part of the series I enjoy the most is carefully infiltrating large enemy bases, but with a new emphasis on the hub area, this has been somewhat forgotten, and when you do leave Prague for story reasons, the game seems to put more focus on being cinematic and keeping the plot moving, rather than on letting the player sneak or stab their way through complicated environments. 
If this is the trade-off we get for the better hub area, then maybe it's worth it, but I'm not sure the game can't feature both. There are some new minor annoyances this time round as well, like how selling items at vendors takes far too many clicks, or how the loading screen when you travel by train is excessively long. But really, in terms of gameplay, Mankind Divided is human revolution with a bigger and better hub area. As for the main story, you want more players Adam Jensen, who is now working for an anti-terrorist division of Interpol called Task Force 29, while also working in secret with a group called the Juggernaut Collective to try to track down and expose the Illuminati. Tension between the augmented and non-augmented populace are continuing to rise, and when a bomb goes off at a train station in Prague, Jensen is tasked with investigating it. Not content to just follow orders anymore, Jensen listens into a conversation his boss at Task Force 29 has with his superiors, where he learns that several terrorist attacks, including the bomb at the station, are going to be blamed on a pro-org group called the Augmented Rights Coalition, or ARC. Jensen is then sent to a large, densely packed org containment ghetto called Gollum City to investigate Talos Rucka, ARC's leader. Gollum is a great location that I wish you could explore further. It's clearly inspired by the real-life Kowloon Walled City, and if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's a rabbit hole worth going down. In fact, someone should tell Frederick Knudsen to make a video on it. Anyway, in not Kowloon City, you work your way to Rucker, but he then dies in a mysterious way after confirming he was not involved in the attacks. Rucker is replaced by an absolute unit of a man named Viktor Marchenko, who pushes Ark towards militancy as the death of Rucker causes augmented unrest to deepen. As Jensen investigates further, he learns that Marchenko is an Illuminati agent, who is planning to use a biological weapon at an event where a group of influential individuals are meeting to discuss their opposition of a new Illuminati-backed UN law. The law will enforce strict measures on augmented individuals around the globe, which the Illuminati are trying to get past as a means to further their power. Jensen ultimately stops Marchenko in Mankind Divided's one and only boss fight, although the exact fate of the lobbyists will be determined by your actions in the final mission. Just as with Human Revolution, there are details to this story that I've skipped over, and the quality of storytelling remains very good. The dialogue is well written, there are important choices which have consequences further along in the game, and the cutscenes are no longer rendered at a distractingly low resolution like in the last game. However, even ignoring the topic of augmentation racism, there are still two problems I have with this narrative. The first is that the Illuminati aren't very effective antagonists. This is mostly because you know exactly who they are, and how they're going to end up. Mankind Divided seems to want to be a mysterious thriller about this sinister secret society, but the mystery itself is already spoiled. This removes all the suspense a good mystery relies on, while also making the Illuminati feel very unthreatening for what's meant to be such a powerful and enigmatic group. I can't help but compare the Illuminati to the Patriots from Metal Gear Solid, who play a similar role in that series. And to summarise my thoughts on the comparison, everything about the Patriots was better, for the first three Metal Gear Solid games at least, because it turns out mysterious groups work a lot better when they have some actual mystery to them. The Illuminati and Mankind Divided seem like a bit of a joke. They come across as a few guys sitting around a table, twirling their metaphorical moustaches while thinking about what dastardly plan to do next. Which brings me to another problem I have this time around, which is that the Illuminati seem pretty evil. They always seemed questionable, but their dubious morality came from their secrecy and desire to control, not from their blatantly evil actions. Yet now they're committing terrorist attacks all over the world, while trying to tear society apart and set up an almost genocide against the augmented population. I always assumed the Illuminati were a powerful group of people who tried to act in the world's best interest and just arrogantly saw themselves as the ones most capable of ruling. Not a group with no concept of right and wrong, who are willing to do anything just to increase their influence. I mean, in all three of the other Deus Ex games, we were given the option to join them, and while this never seemed good, it never seemed truly evil. But now that's changed, which makes this setting much more black and white when the series should be about shades of grey. 
Still, maybe the Illuminati are just represented poorly in this game, and everything will make more sense when we find out more about their plan in the next ge- Oh. Yeah, and I guess that brings us to the final problem. This story isn't very finished. And it's not just the overarching story about the Illuminati, Mankind Divided introduces a number of plot threads that don't find resolution. There are questions raised about the mysterious circumstances surrounding Jensen immediately following the last game's ending, as well as about the implications of the Illuminati agents within Task Force 27, or the identity of Juggernaut Collector Leader Janus, or what will happen to the UN resolution on augmented rights now that the latest Illuminati scheme didn't succeed, and for Jensen as well, also over who are the Illuminati and what do they actually want. And some of these aren't just unanswered questions, they're actively teased throughout the game in a way that suggests answers are on the way. Mankind Divided received a lot of criticism for its abrupt ending. Originally, everyone suspected that this might be a cynical ploy to sell the real ending as DLC, but that didn't happen. In the one substantial piece of DLC we did get, A Criminal Past, it's actually set before the main game as you go undercover as Jensen at an augmented prison complex. This DLC is really good, which is why I wrote this awkward segue to at least mention it. The prison complex is big, exploration is a lot of fun, as at least initially you have to blend in as a prisoner while working out for yourself how best to proceed with your investigation, and the loss of your augment introduces some much needed challenge to freshen up the gameplay. Still, all this DLC really achieved was to remind people of the potential mankind divided systems have, and this is ultimately the last thing we got from the series. Mankind Divided was a really good game, brought down by its poorly handled themes, a weak overall antagonist, and an ending that wasn't very satisfying. As someone who does enjoy optional content, I don't really see this game as being unfinished or lacking in content. The main story can be completed quickly, but the overall amount of content on offer is roughly in line with any other Deus Ex game. The lack of resolution to the overarching plot also doesn't seem like some Achilles heel either in my opinion. Instead it makes the game feel more like a middle part of a trilogy that was given the job of playing for time before the big finale, and it is a bit worse than it could have been as a result, but it's by no means irredeemable. There's also one other thing I did really like about Mankind Divided's narrative, which is the added emphasis on themes of truth and paranoia, something that's been a key feature of the series since its inception, and is a necessary part of the Deus Ex experience in my eyes. Human Revolution did leave you guessing about certain things, particularly about whether you can trust your employer, David Sarif, but the focus was so firmly on technology that other themes of the series seemed a little lost as a result. Mankind Divided rectifies this oversight though, and it does it with style. As a double agent, Jensen is both trying to work out who he himself can and cannot trust, while also worrying about keeping his own illicit activity hidden. There's a point where a side character confronts you and accuses you of snooping around, and even if this is a scripted event which always happens, it still felt impactful to me because I had been snooping around in the task force headquarters, excessively, and now here I am being called out on something I didn't think would ever be acknowledged. This kind of paranoia also manifests within the main narrative by giving the player regular choices about how much information to reveal to your boss, as well as the way it leaves you guessing over the identity of the Illuminati's mole within the organisation, which you can pick away at yourself through optional conversations, and it sure makes your co-workers less likeable when you wonder if maybe they're not just an arsehole, but are also your enemy. Even the Juggernaut Collective's leader Janus, and your main contact within the group Alex, don't seem void of suspicion, and there's nothing like being forced to second guess everyone and everything to accurately represent the unseen threat that a super secret group like the Illuminati are meant to represent. This is in many ways what I want from a Deus Ex storyline, and I also love the tone set by Mankind Divided's version of End Slides. In place of a typical narrator or main character monologue, this game instead opts for a simple newscast, which will recap both the main events of the story and optional side quests you may have got involved with. Except every single one of these things that's reported on has been distorted to the point where the truth is hardly recognisable. All your actions so far are twisted and spun into a web of lies to serve the group you've been trying to oppose. 
It's a reminder that the problems of this world are still out there, and that the real enemy can't just be defeated in a simple boss fight. But it's also a reminder of how small you are, of how your borderline superhuman heroics are still pretty insignificant in the grand scheme of things, and how your supposed victory is only one small battle in a war you're still rapidly losing. Most of all though, it's a promise of more to come, a message that this story will be continued. Except I'm not sure it actually will. With four games released over 16 years, many parts of this series has changed, but its core design philosophy has mostly managed to stay the same. Deus Ex is a series about open-ended design, player choice, emergent solutions, freedom to explore, and the merging of immersive sim and RPG. The original Deus Ex feels like a grand relic from a different age, yet there's still so much to appreciate about how this game is designed, and most of the things it does so well, modern video games barely even try. Invisible War was a clear step down, but Human Revolution and Mankind Divided show that a modern take on a game like this can still be done, and that there's still an audience out there willing to buy it. Whether that audience is big enough, however, is a different question. One of the reasons this series is on ice right now is because Mankind Divided didn't meet Square Enix's ambitious sales targets. When you consider the fact that this game didn't sell all that badly, you have to wonder how realistic Square's targets were, and while Mankind Divided proudly shows off its big budget and cinematic qualities, I'm not really sure these things were that necessary in the first place. Deus Ex isn't Halo or Uncharted, and it's never going to have that level of mass appeal, but as a medium budget experience, I'm sure there's still a large enough audience out there that will continue to support this series if the games retain the features that matter the most. But really, that's on Square Enix, and their decisions with this series haven't always seemed the best choice. Mankind Divided was also criticised for featuring microtransactions, and part of the main game was removed to be sold as a pre-order exclusive DLC. Many people also believe that part of the reason this game left quite so many unanswered questions was because it was rushed out the door before it was ready. The technical problems at launch also support this, and the future of Deus Ex under Square Enix doesn't exactly inspire much confidence, even if future games were guaranteed. Which, they're not. But I hope we get more Deus Ex anyway. It won't be much of a surprise which game in this series I think is the best, but I don't think the gulf between the original game and its modern day successors is as vast as it might seem. When you accept the fact that a modern, big budget version of Deus Ex must make some sacrifices, Human Revolution and Mankind Divided end up seeming like great efforts that stay true to much of what matters about the original, and the only really important thing that seems missing is a narrative that manages to successfully integrate the series' themes to say something meaningful about our world and future. The original Deus Ex did this by using irrational conspiracies to explore rational fears, and as a result, its narrative still feels relevant to this day. In the years since its release, many events have happened that make its bleak version of the future seem closer than we might like. 9-11 brought a war on terror against something we didn't even know we were meant to be terrified of a year earlier. The 2008 recession brought new questions of global economic stability and accountability. The Snowden NSA WikiLeaks showed that powerful individuals spying on the rest of the population isn't as implausible as we might hope, and the COVID-19 epidemic is still currently revealing the deep vulnerability that can occur when factors outside of our control disrupt our modern way of life. Deus Ex is an exploration of the future that uses the anxiety and uncertainty of the present to create a dark reflection of our world, and exploring such things through creative mediums is something that matters. As does continuing the design philosophy of this series, which many people enjoy, but yet is seen so rarely in other games. And that's why it's so disappointing that another Deus Ex game might never be released. 
Eidos Montreal's games showed lots of potential and seemed to be building to an even better conclusion, and that truly amazing modern Deus Ex game that fans were waiting for still feels like it's possible. But whether we'll ever get to find out if that really is the case remains to be seen. The world is changing. The future is unknown. But honestly, I hope it contains more Deus Ex games. It'd give us something to do at least, while we sit inside in lockdown as the world crumbles around us. I mean, I can think of worse ways to spend the end times. You have a single fact to back that up. Number one. A huge thank you to all of my patrons for the continued support, which has allowed me to make this video. These are genuinely uncertain times, and your support means a hell of a lot to me. I'm not sure when the next entire series retrospective will be, but the topic will be decided again by Patreon votes, so look forward to that. Anyway, I'm glad I finally got this video finished. It took a very long time, and uh, just in time for Cyberpunk, perfect timing. Honestly, couldn't be better if I planned it. Wait, what? It was delayed again? But what am I meant to do now for a whole extra month? <sighs> oh well, maybe it's time to start working on that other video I've been putting off. So, I guess I'll see you in a while. <laughs>